Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the uh, Catherine and Stuart Imminent Spotlight panel. Um, thanks to our special guests, Catherine and Stuart Imminent. And uh, this is their first time at SPX. Uh, before I forget, thanks to Esther Kim of Phantom Comics and the SPX Programming for setting this panel up. Um, my name is Jim Dugan. And um, so Catherine and Stuart have, uh, have a long and distinguished careers in both mainstream and independent comics publishing. Catherine is known for her uh, journey into mystery featuring Lady Sif, Runaways, Heralds, X-Men, Pixie Strikes Back, Agent Carter, Operation Sin, and Patsy Walker, Hellcap, which is done partly in collaboration with Stuart. Uh, Stuart's body of work runs the gamut of high profile titles for the major mainstream publishers, including Legion of Superheroes, Superman, Thor, Ultimate Spider-Man, Avengers, Next Wave, Fear Itself, X-Men, Captain America, and most recently, an obscure cult favorite called Star Wars. Um, but this being SPX, we're not gonna talk about any of that. Um, and we're gonna focus on their self-published, independent, and small press work. So, uh, especially because this is their first time at the Small Press, small press Expo, we thought it was a good opportunity to put the spotlight on them and discuss the, the, the breadth of their career and body of work together. Um, so I guess my first question for you guys is, so you have been working together in collaboration in comics mm. since the late 80s, is that about right? It's about, yeah. and so my question is. Yeah. 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 Yep, yes. so, 88 actually. Okay, so how did, th so this is a chicken egg question. Did you, how did you meet and did your collaboration grow from your relationship or the other way around? Do I start? Do you start. It's a great story. Yeah, Just okay. wait. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stuart and I met at um, York University in Toronto. Uh, he was there for visual arts. I was there for uh, theater design. Um, and I had auditioned in Ottawa for the program uh, with a guy who went to high school uh, in my town who, as it turns out, had been on a band exchange at Stuart's rural high school uh, a couple of years previously. So we all got to university and this uh, gentleman, Joe Kilmartin, was sort of the, the bridge between the two of us. And um, we were going to see, uh, our university used to show movies like in these massive, uh, like 800, 900 seat lecture halls on Friday nights. And uh, it was Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asleep in the hallway and Stuart showed up with Joe and that was basically that. <laughs> so that's how we met. Uh, and that was I was asleep in a corner, and that was in 1986. Six. So, um, yeah, and so we were living in Toronto at the time, uh, and there was a very vibrant comic scene, black and white, independent publishing. Um, there was a distributor, Andromeda in Toronto, which was amazing, not the sort of monopoly that we're seeing now with Diamond. So you could actually get on the streetcar, go to a distributor, show them your little books, and get in their catalog and sell your comics. It was pretty awesome. Um, but Mr. X was being published at the time, too, and... Right. Vortex was uh, a yeah. publisher uh, of note uh, in Toronto at that time, and, um, and yeah, Mr. X, so uh, Hernandez Brothers, and then Seth, and then uh, Vortex also published Yummy Fur by Chester Brown. Chester Brown, yeah. Um, and Ted McKeever's Transit. Um, so it, it seemed, uh, rather than the, the sort of story where uh, people sort of had to be in the in the New York general area to try and break into um, uh, the major publishers at least. Uh, for us, uh, it seemed more sort of tangible and real to have people that we knew um, making comics, uh, publishing comics, but also creating them uh, in our town. And it seemed like something that was possible for us. So we actually, uh, we did an issue of, uh, something that we wanted to promote to or, or, or propose to uh, Bill Marks at Vortex to have him maybe consider publishing and we went to his office and showed him the thing and he was polite but dismissive and said why don't you try doing it yourself so we thought okay we will and and uh, and we did and it was actually a, a great thing for us um, we uh, we had the, the covers professionally printed, offset printing, but we did the uh, interiors on a, a friend's father's uh, business photocopier overnight. So we printed 250 copies uh, 
and just about ruined the photocopier. <laughs> uh, and um, and then, like Catherine said, we we uh, we took a whole bunch of them, and we took them to stores, and we took them to the dis distributor, and um, and really did it the hard way. But um, you know, before digital access, before the internet, before social media, this was the way you uh, reach people. Um, and uh, and we you know we had moderate success. I don't I don't think we actually uh, there they are. these these were our two books. Um, we didn't actually make any money, but we didn't lose too much. <laughs> um, but I think I think pretty quickly uh, after we did we did three issues each of Head Cheese and Playground, and. Um, and uh, then Catherine was concentrating more on school. I, meanwhile, had dropped out of university and was um, working retail jobs all over and trying to gear a portfolio towards trying to make uh, a living illustrating rather than a loss illustrating. <laughs> and um, so I was sending work to all kinds of publishers, by, again, by mail, not, no email or, or anything like that at that time. And, and, um, Mostly it was silence on the other end, but uh, eventually a couple of small, very small publishers uh, bit, and I spent the next five or six years trying to build that body of work until um, uh, Marvel and DC showed some interest. And that's where uh, I spent the next, well, until Moving Pictures, which was 2000 and uh, we started online in 2004. Well, I'm probably jumping way ahead for you. That's okay. But we can, we can <laughs> that, but, um, it's the whole story. Yeah. That, well, but that, we said it was a great one. It's a great, <laughs> great story. Well, you know, it, it's interesting, and having found these things and, re and read some other interviews with you, that, that you know, this, so this is, if you guys can see, yeah. for the playground on the, on the, um, the interior page there, there's an there's a actual rubber stamp and a numbering of, you know, number 22 out of 250. So you guys, you know, you actually hand stamped a number of these things and stapled it, which I think is the experience probably of a lot of folks who are, who are sitting upstairs right now and, uh, and very similar to what they had done. I, I guess, were there shows? I, I know SPX wasn't around mm -hmm. then, but were there, you mentioned mailing them and bringing them to distributors. Were there, were there shows? Were there small press shows of any of that kind where you could sort of God, show your wares? I don't, or? Well, I don't. There, were, there were comic shows, certainly, but I think they were even more like uh, a book fair than um, Comic Con is now or, or in Toronto Fan Expo or the New York show, um, where it was, uh, you know, you'd, in the late 80s, early 90s, it, there was no sort of media crossover, so you didn't have the, the movie stars and TV stars and, and, uh, and that kind of thing showing up. It was mostly comic book dealers and a few guest artists and writers from somewhere else um, and uh, and uh, people that either had you know a mini comic or a small press work uh, and and their table um, but it was it was all sort of not formalized in the way yeah. that we sort of you know we think of a, a certain kind of show now like SBX um, and it's it has a mandate and it has a mission and, and uh, you expect a certain kind of uh, material uh, to be on display here, but it, it was sort of a mishmash at that time. Yeah. yeah. So no, I would say that uh, I, I don't think Why that we did. Why are you doing this, Jim? No. I, where are you getting this stuff? <laughs> Why? Yeah, the Who authorized this? What is this um, really all about? <laughs> Um, so I no. The answer is no. That that there. Um, I don't think <laughs> we did. Well, there were comic shows, but I don't yeah. think that we were showing no. our stuff. I don't think we had like a publisher table with our couple of books on I mean, at all. Like it was mostly just trying with quarter to quarter bins, like retailers with quarter bins yeah. at school, mm. like public schools and yeah. places so the, out by I, the airport. The goal for us was to get it into stores. Mm -hmm. not to go directly to the consumer, uh, right. the consumer. Although there was a there was a magazine called Fact Sheet 5 yeah. uh, many years ago I which there was still is fact is it are they did they not come back? I don't know. Do you do you know what Fact Sheet 5 is anybody? Fact Sheet 5 was the shit. It was <laughs> uh, 
It was a it periodical, was and it was it was the internet in magazine form, and you could. I guess you sent them a copy. I don't even know if you had to send them a copy. I think you could just send them like your ad. It was basically classified ads for self-publications. It was this fat sort of little phone book that you could go and buy in a magazine shop. And in it was just page after page after page where you could write away for people's books. It was amazing. And I think it had a bit of a resurgence Recently, I'm not sure if it's, and I don't even, I mean, I think it was being published out of Toronto, but available uh, through North America, but it was, it was like the internet. It was like a phone book for independent publications, and it was amazing. It changed people's lives, absolutely. So for us, it meant selling directly to the consumer by mail order, okay. as yeah. opposed to distributor and then retail stores. Did you guys get letters? Did you have correspondence with your readership? Were there, was there any kind of, because it's obviously, if you're not sitting at a table in front of somebody, it's a yeah. different sort of thing, but even, you know. Yeah, you know. our address is actually the, where we were living at the time on, I guess, Lippincott or whatever. Yeah. Somebody else lives there now. Um, <laughs> Don't go the Send please. them mail. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we did actually get some post uh, through, that, through that address. Um, you know, not a lot. But, um, yeah, there were only 250, 250 copies. copies. <laughs> right. It would have had to have been a really ambitious readership. <laughs> so. Or desperate. <laughs> desperate. <laughs> so after you put these out, I think the next thing that I'm aware of that you put out together um, was Never As Bad As You Think. Is that correct? There were a couple of little things before that. There well, was a... Go back a slide, because this... This, I think, is from Playground? This uh, is from yeah. Playground, but... Um, I think this is the one that was published. This is the Caliber Press one, yeah. do you think? I don't know. It's Google. It yeah. So oh, I, don't yeah. Actually, I don't actually have physical copies. Oh, they're, okay. they're very we can rare. change that. We self-published three issues. Under. Caliber Press in Michigan uh, was doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of black and white stuff. They did um, um, uh, Baker Street, and they did The Crow, um, and... Um, uh, a, a lot of things, and, and they, for some reason, uh, Gary Reed was a publisher, and he's doing, uh, still doing comic-related stuff in Michigan, shows, I think, and, uh, and he offered to publish uh, new material with the same characters from our self-published editions of Playground, so we had one issue with him. And then you were doing school stuff, and then I was trying to, they're, they're, they're both the same story. Um, the one on the top is a book that we did, and again, it was a very small object. It was like postcard size, um, and it uh, collected a, a web comic that we'd been doing. Um, it was based. A, oh, yeah. Illustration it was based Friday. on the the word prompt from Illustration Friday. Oh, so FW, sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that so we would get the the word in the morning, and I would uh, walk the dog. And by the time I came back, I would have the strip done, and it would all fit on like a little post-it note, and then Stuart would draw it, and we would put it up. And we just did that uh, once so it was a week. So a, a once a week webcomic that we did. When we thought that webcomics were going to be really big, and, and yet, <laughs> it didn't pan out as a webcomic for us. We, uh, we you know, we'd tried charging for it, and that didn't work, and we tried to offer it for free, and I don't think too many people saw it. Um, so we put out a print edition for it, and um, uh, we had a table at one of the early TCAFs in Toronto, and, uh, and that's where we sold our version, and um, at some point, uh, Ross Ritchie and, and Mark Wade at Boom got it in their heads that they wanted to do yeah, except their they own edition. Yeah, except they didn't identify themselves. So we get this email from some guy <laughs> saying to us, we really want to publish, never as bad as you think. I'm like, whatever, dude, thanks, that's very kind. And then it turns out it was Ross Ritchie. I had no idea. I felt so, anyway. Um, which is great, and they did a, a beautiful edition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was great. Um, it was a lovely hardcover book um, in a landscape format, and we added two strips to to make the story make a little bit more sense. And um, and they published it, except that at that time, Boom did not have um, any other material like this. 
uh, in their uh, roster. So our book was kind of an outlier for them. And I don't think it... Uh, I don't think it sold that well, actually. I think the word you're looking for is snake. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but it looked nice. Yeah, it was really um, good. But, uh, but again, it was a case of being ahead of our time, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I guess I'm curious a little bit, because you had, um, for there had been a gap in, in terms of the, 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 like doing a lot of comics together for mm-hmm. a while. Was it, what was it about this project or exercise that that made you keep going with it was it the uh, the fact that it was sort of digestible chunks like once a week was it that sort of formalist play aspect that that maybe allowed you to scratch some itches creatively Um, yeah I think we both like uh, we both really like a project Um, but a finite right so that you know that accounts for the small additions of things um and this way of making work with Illustration Friday, we decided we'll do it for a year. Um, and it, 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 we could sort of see the top, bottom, and sides of it, which, uh, which was nice. Um, but I think uh, you were out of school by that point. Yeah. And I was, we'd always wanted to do more stuff together and and well get get back to yeah, what we'd started doing and maybe try longer works but um it was mostly at this point it was mostly me that was uh too busy or concentrating right. on other things rather than Catherine concentrating on other things uh that stood in the way um so this seemed like the the, the web finally now we're in the internet era of the story <laughs> Um, uh, it seemed like a, a catalyst for us to be able to uh, do something in small chunks and then amass a larger piece, a uh, comprehensive piece over the course of a year. Um, and it seemed like, you know, I figured that if I didn't try at least to carve out one day a week uh, out of my normal working schedule, then I would never do it so um, this was a certainly a well it was an experiment like all the other things that we've done together um, but uh, but a, an experiment in trying to to manufacture something of a, a greater length uh, rather than these uh, short discreet yeah. <laughs> editions that we've done before well that's a good transition to the next uh, project, which is Moving Pictures, which you can buy in published form upstairs from the <coughs> top shelf table if you don't have it already. Um, but this also uh, began um, as, well, the project was longer. It was always intended to be a longer yeah. work, but it was released in more discreet uh, form on the web, like a page a week. Yeah, it was a page, page a week, and that was just a way of getting it done again. Um, that was a, you know, whether or not anybody else was paying attention or was expecting it to, to pop up every week. Um, we had we decided to make that commitment to, I guess we could call it a publishing schedule, um, just to get it done. It it still took four four years or so, um, but yeah, the, I mean people ask us about you know our you know digital plans or our approach to web based work or whatever, and really it's never been because we have some sort of deep and abiding uh, love for 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 digital. It's just for us, it's always been a way to make sure that it gets done. It's just a self-imposed structure that gets the work right. uh, finished. It's very easy to, to say that, you know, you're too busy this week to, to g- commit to your web project or, you know, you've got too much in your plate. But this was, uh, like, like Catherine said, and like uh, the structure for, for uh, Never As Bad As You Think, you know, even if you've got, even if you think you have one person um, that's waiting for it that week, then that's an unspoken commitment to that audience. So we felt, even if it wasn't true, there was some <laughs> kind of obligation that that uh, motivated us beyond, um, you know, just wanting to do this thing. And we knew that it was it was going to be quite long, and that that uh, at least while I was under contract with uh, Marvel, that. I would never be able to say, well, I'll just take three months off or six months off and, and just get it done all in one shot. I, I couldn't, we couldn't manage that financially and we, we couldn't manage it in terms of time. So um, 
being able to set aside, you know, a Sunday or um, some kind of holiday time or, you know, after dinner or whatever, just to make sure that it got done. That was, that was our publishing plan. And like Catherine said, it still took a number of years. And then when we put everything together, then when we had the whole 150 pages done and in a form that more resembled a book, it still took another couple of months of work to try and uh, correct things that um, were drawn in one way years before and had evolved naturally into being drawn another way years after. And so, so basically every page on this was redrawn after it was done already. Wow. I love the way you <laughs> <laughs> And everybody out. goes, oh, man. <laughs> well, uh, it, so you've, you've described this as an examination of value and commodification and desire and the hierarchy and valuation of objects. <laughs> Uh, that's, how's, <laughs> how's that for that must be you uh, <laughs> it's uh, so just for those of you who haven't sorry. read it and you absolutely should it's set in Paris during the Nazi occupation and mostly is a dialogue between a Canadian curator at the Louvre seeking to move and or hide art and her Nazi interlocutor slash lover um, the so, Nazi but, lover yeah um, you've, you've, and it's, it, anyway, uh, you've, <laughs> you, you've said though that you, you were, you wanted to focus, you obfuscated the setting deliberately and you, if one of the examples that you used in, in previous discussions is, you know, that's, that black flag is a Nazi flag, but you blacked it out completely. Um, I remember there was another page with the newspaper headlines kind of blacked out. So you've, mm -hmm. you know, you've given the images enough specificity to sort of ground it in a, yeah. in a time and a place, but not so much, I guess, as to limit it. Could you talk about, I guess, your thinking there on, and what your intent was? It's a really, really small story. Um, it's a story in which, uh, you know, action consists of, you know, maybe somebody sits down. And then <laughs> if we get really crazy, I think she takes off her jacket at one point. Like, um, it, it's just, it's this strangled quiet still. It's, there's a, this veneer of stillness over the whole thing. Um, having said that, it, it's, it's absolutely based in historical period, it's based on historical fact and historical events which have been widely documented and reported. So it's not, there's nothing uncovered here. Um, I think most people have seen those photographs of the American soldiers that uncovered the art hordes in the salt mines. And if you haven't, I encourage you to go and look at them because it's astonishing. It's just tens of thousands of works of art that were stashed underground and in other places. But there, was, there are a couple of very famous uh, discoveries that were made. Um, so Stuart and I don't have anything to say about the Second World War. We certainly don't, you know, we have no authority to do so. We don't have anything to add to the extraordinary uh, volume of work, uh, both fictional and non-fictional, uh, that's been done about that time. Um, but we were interested in this moment and, and what it could say about two characters. And we, in the story, they very kind of determinedly turn their back on the historical background. So it's there, but most of it takes place in this one small room. So it's, it's really sort of focused inward on this dynamic, on the interplay between these, these two people. Um, so every time we were putting in, uh, like all the, all the street scenes, all the, you know, it was heavily researched, everything is, is accurate, all those streets exist, all those buildings exist. Um, but the more we started to put up the signs and symbols, it just started to get kind of overwrought and stupid looking. Frankly, it's like nobody, like we get, we, we know when this takes place, right? And I don't think anybody, I don't think the pages benefited from swastikas on the flags or, um, and this book is so heavily spotted with black, like there's so much shadow um, in this book that somehow the sort of blacking out of these specific references um, worked well graphically, but also narratively, I would say. You, you also, there's, a, there's a, a specific formal approach that you use, which I think is you know, a six panel grid, but then you, you break it out to emphasize certain action points. But then there's also the way that the characters are rendered 
um, and the situations are rendered versus say how the pieces of art are represented, mm -hmm. which is more you know naturalistic. What was the your, your sort of thinking in and why to do it that way, and what were the, the the different I guess art styles being applied there, and why was it? Hmm. Well, um, it was. I mean. My ego says that it was a way to to show off that I could do you know a couple of different things in in a single context um, but the um, I guess what you're not showing here is that there were a couple of uh, of passes uh, on this story which were which didn't have this this uh, accurately put uh, strangled quality um, and uh, and they just didn't like Catherine said stupid but you know they just didn't seem right uh, so they were more lush they were more realistic I think I did like five sets of samples uh, all telling the same story all paced the same way but just different art styles uh, trying to figure out um, one uh, and primarily what would be most appropriate to the story and to what I could uh, conceivably come back to after five or six days working in a conventional mainstream Marvel house style, what would be uh, plausible for me to be able to uh, turn on uh, in terms of a style that was unique to this. And, uh, and it just got simpler and simpler and it seemed more and more appropriate to the way that the script was uh, was written. Um, the other thing that that uh, that Catherine didn't mention was that uh, the the script was written as a as a play or as a a screenplay, um, not specifically for that purpose, but that was that was just how it was. It was like there were hardly any stage directions, hardly any description of setting. Um, but just dialogue back and forth. Um, so there were no uh, page breaks, there were no panel breaks, we just, we had no set number of uh, pages and no deadline, so we just wanted to see how long it would take. The, the only organic thing about this was to, to see uh, how long it would end up being. Um, and, um, but the, the gridding of the page, as you say, uh, was all sort of part of this process of trying to formalize this look as much as possible. And then, uh, but at the same time, I realized that when we did see these works of art, um, they sort of had to, they were the one thing, or the things that sort of mandated uh, existing outside the, uh, the context of the story. Um, they talk about them, they describe them, um, but the, at the same time, they are not part of the interplay between the characters. They're, they're, uh, they're something that the characters perceive. I mean, at the, it's the difference between, it's, it's sort of flipping on, the, uh, on its head, the idea that, you know, I'm, I'm real, I'm three-dimensional, but I look at this and it's a painting and it's flat, and I perceive that the difference is, is that it's fake and I'm real. And for this story, it seemed more appropriate for the characters to be rendered in this, in this way where they, uh, their identities were, were such that they could be clearly defined, or extremely sharply defined, literally sharply defined, um, by line work, and yet the, the paintings had this, this soft, naturalistic, realistic quality, um, or, or sculptures in, in this case. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Five out of six. <laughs> uh, speaking of art objects, we, we, I don't think we, I wanna make sure to get to Russian Olive, um, but speaking of uh, limited edition art objects, this is Snipe. Uh, which is no longer available in physical form, uh, but is quite uh, part of the, your experimental work together and also quite beautiful. It is available through Comixology, so you can get it digitally. So again, if you haven't read this, don't weren't able to get one of the X hundred copies of the. I think I made fifty. I sort of that's that's the limit of my physical, you know, the cutting and folding and scoring and stapling and all of that. I can 
50, sometimes 100, but uh, really 50 is sort of the limit of my physical capability for bookmaking at this point. Well, it was also so, like a flip Yeah, book. it was it's a double-sided flip book. If you, it's <laughs> it was stamped and screen printed and It's pretty amazing, but stupid. it's also amazing digitally, so. Um, so, yes. Rational of Dred Kin, that, that, that brings us to where we are. Um, available for Madhouse Books upstairs, where these folks are, are going to be uh, all weekend. Uh, you've described this as a romance that isn't romantic and a ghost story that isn't frightening. Um, what was, if you can describe a little bit, the, the, the genesis of this story to make it, uh, what was it that made you feel this is a story you had to tell? And it and arose from a particular, um, I guess, uh, situation where there was some correspondence between the two of you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I was uh, I was in upstate New York at the Women's Studio workshop. workshop, which is a bookmaking workshop. If any of you are interested, uh, men and women, if you're interested in limited edition book objects and printmaking, whatever, the Women's Studio Workshop runs the most amazing residencies, uh, apply. Um, it's in Rosendale, New York. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great facility. Anyway, so um, I was at Women's Studio Workshop editioning a book, and uh, Stuart was trying to update his illustrator skills, and he started sending me these images, uh, one a day, uh, while I was there. And I had, I'm going to get this backwards, and it doesn't, none of it really matters. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I ended up writing a response to those images, um, and then the front half of the book was already existing in script form that we were starting to talk about how we wanted to put it together. Um, the original set of images that Stuart sent me are not included in this book, but the text is. So this book we put together over about, it took four or five years to put it together, um, and we had these pieces, so we had this script. For the first, for the illustrated part of the book, we had this prose work. We knew that these things were somehow connected. Um, and over the course of four or five years, we just, we pulled this thing apart and put it back together, um, just trying to make the, the shape of this book. Uh, so at, it's about two people. There's a plane crash at the beginning. Uh, they are separate, she's in the plane. Um, she may or may not have survived the crash, although that becomes clear. The clues are all there as to what actually happened to her. Um, he's left at home. He's supposed to be writing a catalog essay for a show that is uh, it's not going well. He's got like the worst case of writer block you've ever seen. He's basically turning into cement, this guy. Um, and he doesn't have any information as to what happened to her, um, but he feels it. He, he's, he feels he knows, and it, it's sort of his journey towards knowing in the absence of any information that she's gone. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um. uh, and that sort of that sort of <laughs> mimicked our our situation when Catherine was away. Um, the, the one thing that you didn't mention that that was uh, another sort of um, part of the genesis of it was that you you had no cell phone service whatsoever. Yeah, you had to stick yeah. your head in a corner of this one building and not move, <laughs> and then maybe you got phone service. So this is why we started this email correspondence, and you were gone for 56 days, yeah. or, I think, and I had I had uh, decided that I was going to tell you a story with pictures, right? One a day over over the time that you were while away. improving your illustrative yeah. skills. I mean, that really was the reason. Ah, uh, yeah. It's so romantic. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, I think a couple of years went by, and I yeah. and we had this this 56-page illustrated thing, and and I knew that the what I had to say in the story was not worth sharing to anybody but you. And I said, well, we should do something with this, with these 56 images, and and I said that for a couple of years, and you said, well, okay, finally, and then you wrote the yeah. first pass draft for the first half of, or the first two-thirds of uh, what became Russian Olive. And then it sort of fell back to me. The conversation came back to me to illustrate it in comic form. So I had started this conversation with Catherine, sending her pictures. She sent me a script uh, with no dialogue. And then I <laughs> sent her back Still these, so angry uh, about that. No, I'm not angry. <laughs> 
it worked. Okay. Um, so I started sending back the the comic pages. Um, and again, like moving pictures, there were there was no deadline, there was no format, there were no there was no page count. It just was going to happen uh, the way it happened. And um, uh, and then when I was done or had or was close to being done, then yeah. you revisited this and then addressed the dialogue. More and then, yeah. you know, I was still saying, well, I still have these 56 illustrations that we still haven't used. <laughs> uh, so that was part of the genesis of doing the last third, which is mostly prose. Um, but I think at some point we realized, do, do you have some, some of the pictures of, I from I the last? I, I wish I did. Okay. I, um, we can show them. Um, and then I'll get all emotional again. No, it's, so it's stupid. So it's <laughs> it's so prose based at at the back, but it's also got a sequence of images, um, which is almost uh, well. We told ourselves it was like found comics, and we uh, we knew that there was going to be a sequence of images along with this prose piece, but we didn't know what it was for years and years, uh, for literally years and years. So we're doing this other part of it, and, and that's going well, but we still have this other thing that we don't quite understand how it fits. Right. Um, and it's and getting more and more difficult to deal with it, which is why I get, you know, ridiculously emotional about it. <laughs> There's something lurking in that back third that we still don't really understand, and every time we had to go back and look at it, we're both like, you know, a, a mess. Brain. It's so yeah. stupid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but part of the, part of the the back third has to do, I'm not spoiling anything, part of the back third has to do with the story of uh, Jumbo the Elephant and uh, P.T. Barnum and Jumbo's uh, death, again, I'm not spoiling anything, um, in a dies. small Ontario town. No. Um, so we visited this town. We went on this road trip together, hoping that we would get this final bit of inspiration to figure out what these these sequenced images were going to be. And we had a couple of ideas, and it wasn't working, and it was starting to rain, and it was really <laughs> a miserable trip. Yeah. Um, and we went to this industrial part of town, which we, which we knew, but had been quite run down since the last time we'd been there. And um, can I tell this part? Is this ruining the story? There was this building. I'm telling it. <laughs> <laughs> There was this, this building, it's an abandoned candy factory in London, Ontario, and, um, and we went around the corner and we found that the, uh, the warehouse part of the building had had um, all its windows systematically broken. And uh, we're, we're in the car and we're in this uh, parking lot and weeds are growing out of the concrete and uh, all these windows are broken and it's raining and we're just not having a great time and we're just sort of looking at the window and we're wondering what the next step is going to be and we're still kind of fascinated by this ruined industrial landscape and, and we started to think about what brought the building to this point and uh, but we also started to look at these windows as being isolated images um, and um, and and then the whole landscape of windows is being a sequence of isolated images, and that's comics. Um, and the uh, and the negative spaces, the broken parts of the windows, started to look like figures, like shapes, like animals and people. And um, now I'm getting kind of yeah, I know, up. right? It's ridiculous. Um, and. We, it was like this, like found comics, yeah. or like comics found us, yeah. that there had, uh, we were able to, I don't think anybody else who's actually read this has well, except talked that about this. It's, uh, there is rock throwing, so it's like rock throwing through these windows, and, and a friend of ours has read the a lot book of rocks a couple of times, in the book. and she throws rocks. Uh, into the water in the first half of the book, and Ray's like, yeah, I really love the, you know, she's throwing rocks and he throws rocks, and it's like, we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so, you know, I think you just, you think about something for so long, you work on a book for so long, you pull it apart and put it back together so many times, and I think even if you don't really know what you're doing, you know, your concerns are present. Like, the things that you're thinking about, you're thinking about all the way through, even if it's just like the lizard at the back of your brain that's working on it for you. And so I think if, uh, 
you know, you pay enough attention, you invest enough uh, energy and emotion into something, and it all sort of starts to come back around, and the pieces start to fit together, and it's, uh, and that's basically what happened. It sort of, there was like this magical kind of confluence that happened with all the parts of this. Uh, which ended with us, you know, fighting in a rainy parking lot <laughs> in London, Ontario. The end. <laughs> so. Well, that's actually a fantastic way to end. I want to make sure to leave a little bit of time for folks in the audience to ask some questions of uh, Stuart and Catherine. Uh, and it's interesting because I was going to ask you about that last sequence in the book and yeah. how it informed, so you guys anticipated all that. Um, of so, of course, <laughs> of course they Professionals did. all the way. So... Um, <laughs> So if anyone, uh, you guys, I understand, if anyone has some questions for Stuart and Catherine, I would uh, ask if you use the microphone there in the middle. And uh, you guys have giveaways that yeah, you brought down. Yeah, we have down. three copies of these to give away, and they come with, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, but three reading enhancements that go with the books. <laughs> so if you ask a question, you get a number, and then we'll random generate and give these three away. So, so who could resist? Anyone? Anyone got some questions? Could you use the microphone, please? Oh. Yeah. Uh, let's make sure. You're number one. It's your okay. incumbent upon you to remember yeah. your number. <laughs> so, I mean, you've obviously put a huge amount of thought into this, like far more than I, you know, just, um, you know, I was at the booth earlier and I was just kind of like scanning through it and just like, oh, hey, this is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, but just like the sheer amount of thought that goes into that, do you, um, do you think that's like required of comics? Like, um, you know, you talk about the time you spend in Marvel and DC and that kind of just, sort of fades in the back, but do you think this is sort of the evolution of comics and this is where they should definitely proceed, this just layer upon layer upon layer of thought? Uh, I think there's room for, for everything. You sure. know, uh, I think the work that we do in the mainstream absolutely makes uh, our independent work better. Um, there's a kind of rigor. It certainly makes it possible. Right, well, <laughs> yeah. financially. But there's a, there's a kind of rigor that's involved in the monthly schedule with Marvel or DC that is, uh, until you've done it, you don't, uh, there's a kind of grind about it that requires you to up your skill set and get down to business and really figure out what you're doing and be careful and about it. You know, clearly that doesn't always come through with everything that gets published. But, um, you know, the only thing harder than a monthly book is a done in one, like a 20 page one shot. They're brutal. And so the skills that you need to bring to telling those stories in that way it, like I said, it introduces a kind of rigor in your work, and it's the same way with um, with the drawing. Um, so I think because because we do that work um, within those st structures and parameters, uh, it helps us to really cut loose and apply what we've learned there in a, a, an arena where there are no rules. Um, but as far as the you know the future of comics. I mean, I just one of my favorite comics is this absolutely idiotic uh, little French book about this serial killer who sews chicken parts onto his victims. Right? <laughs> it's not deep, but it's hilarious and it's beautifully told and it's totally charming. And so you know, I just I just want people to be curious. Frankly, I think being curious is the best thing that we can be as readers and creators. So, number one. Yeah. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> uh, hi there. Uh, I'm actually curious because I would love to know if you have any tips for the storytelling aspect of making comics. So everyone knows about the art part. The art part is definitely an essential part, but I think uh, how to tell an effective sequential story gets lost a lot in that discussion. So for long term and for the 20 page one shots, what are some tips you could provide? Um, I think. Uh, what I see a lot is people not actually looking uh, at comics. There's a, it's very valuable uh, on pages. Count panels. Count words and balloons. It helps you to understand the mechanics of what's happening on a page. So if you have a comic that you like and you like the way the pages look, count the panels. See the rhythm of it. Notice where the turns, the page turns happen. Um, notice where the key panels are on a page. That's you have to. Um, I've seen a lot of scripts that come in, a lot of writers that are not writing visually. Um, and when I'm writing for whoever I'm writing for, I thumbnail everything. They're terrible, um, but, and it's not always necessarily the best solution for the page, but I know that there is one. Um, so I think you need, to, you need to be able to see it, even if what you're seeing is not what the artist is going to end up drawing, you need to be able to see the shape of it 
in your head, for sure. So it's, I think, for comic storytelling, see the page. It's absolutely critical, and a lot of people don't, don't do it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Number three. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for coming to SPX. It's really great to uh, effectively you. meet you guys. <laughs> um, I kind of have two questions that are somewhat related. At least I could have some crossover. Uh, the first one is working as a collaborative team. Obviously, you talked about Rush and Olive and how that came together, but with the other books and maybe current stuff you're working on, how does the collaboration go? Is it a back and forth, or is it just a, an A and a B? And then secondly, I'm just curious of this, uh, of a lot of creators, but what are your kind of generic question? What are your influences, both as a writer and artists? I'll answer the first bit. Um, my advice in collaboration is just to be flexible, whether you're uh, coming at it from an artist's point of view or, or a writer's. Um, I think it's it's more common to be in a collaborative situation than it uh, is not. So. Uh, to to go into it with a proprietary attitude that you know you're providing the most important part and that you are just trying to get somebody else to do the part that you're not capable of doing is not the right way. Um, and but that also means giving up a lot of the or at least half of the creative freedom. So um, if if you're a writer and you're uh, you write five panels uh, of a sequence and your artist comes back and says, well, I think I can make it into six panels or seven panels and this is why I think it's effective. I think you need to be open to that. Um, and it's the same with an artist. If um, if you get a script and you, you look at it and you can't picture it or it you know it's not making sense to you, you just have to discuss that with your, your collaborator and, and see what it was that that person uh, intended. Um, maybe it's something that uh, they didn't formulate fully and, and are open to uh, having reinterpreted or whether, maybe it's something that they just didn't write down and, uh, and that uh, they've, they've come up with another solution or you can come up with a solution together. But I, we often hear about people that uh, that are very determined to have their personal vision uh, realized even though they are absolutely dependent on working with other people. And that just doesn't seem like the, the way to go. No. Um, as to influences, I would say just be open to all kinds of things. I know that Catherine said, you know, look at comics and look at the structure of comics, and that's true. For um, writing comics. Hmm? For writing comics. Right. Yeah. But um, but uh, it, it also applies to, I'm. there are a lot of writers currently that are writing loosely uh, veiled film scripts. Mm -hmm. And you can see where things uh, would work well in a sequence of images or work well in a moving image, but don't work well in a static image. So, um, but that's sort of a caveat because I think that uh, it's more important to, to see how stories are being told whether it's just in prose or whether it's in other visual media or, or in comics, uh, or rather not just in comics. Yeah, I'm just gonna backtrack to whoever asked me about the future of comics. The one thing that I would like to see go away right now is all these comics that basically are film pitches. It's driving me crazy. I want, you know, we're very interested in comics that do things that only comics can do. Um, so, yeah. I don't think it's doing comics any favors. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Uh, folks, I'm, I've, I've been given the, uh, the, the notice that we are okay. out of time. Okay, wait, so, so three, we'll so take... you're, you are four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten at the back, right? You stood up even though you didn't answer a question, so we're gonna generate but numbers. Come to the, if it's like burning question for you, please come to the table and we'll answer it. Okay, so. We're gonna generate random numbers between one and 10. Who's number one? Is number one is number one. one. Who's one? In the plaid shirt. Okay. Yeah. This is a 1968 Ontario roadmap oh, of Northern wow. Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> it is the most beautiful illustrated thing you've ever seen. It's a work of art. Okay, who's next? All right, thank you. 
All right. Second one is number 10, who didn't ask a question, but hey! is. This is a 1952 Trees of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. And the last one is number three. That gentleman right there. No, it's him. It's him. This is a new old stock safety vest from world famous from our village grocery store <laughs> because hunting season is coming. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Give a big thank you to Catherine and Stuart Eminem. Thanks. And thanks to you all for coming and asking questions. Thanks.